to you. I see that there be a goodly crowd gathered by the fire this night. Lords and ladies, masters and maids all, I am Tate Nightfall, storyteller and bard at your humble service. I see by your strange clothes and hear by your heathen tongue that you have all travelled far to be here this night. Well, fear you not. Strange to mine eyes as you are, I'll not hold it against you. Now the story you're about to hear is both ancient and new, enacted each and every day in more tongues than I've ever heard, and that's a lot. But I digress. Our story takes place in the tiny kingdom of Selenor. It is a peaceful place, nestled on a broad plain, cut in twain by the river Drin, home to many a farmer, goat herder, and fisherman alike. The land is ruled these many years by old King Roland, a wise and gentle man. He is left alone these many years to raise his willful daughter Drea after the passing of his queen. Now the princess, as I mentioned, was just a wee bit too sharp for her own good, and she detested the fawning bootlickers and toadies of the court. Men were forever trying to court her good favors in hopes of being made the next heir to the throne. Only one man, well, a lad really, caught her eye with his unassuming ways and simple speech. The court bard Arkin was a musician of no mean skill and friend to every man, including the king. But Arkin was painfully shy around the princess. And although she fancied him, Propriety would not let her speak her heart, for even in such an advanced society as this, we humble bards are no match for royal blood. And so she pined for him, and he for her, all very hopelessly gooey and romantic-like, if that's your idea of a good time. Until one stormy day, there came a hammering at the castle gates. There was a group of farmers there, who were soaked to the bone and scared witless. When the guards let them in out of the rain, they demand to be taken to the king at once. Well, the king comes down to see what the matter is. Giants, your majesty, they says. Giants have overrun the kingdom. Well, the king grew pale at these words, for his Selenor was ever a peaceful place and had no real standing army of its own. Go to the castle. Bring everyone into the castle for protection. Then he turned to his wise men for a solution, and they came up with the usual business of hiring a knight or two to dispatch of the beasties. The king thought on this for a moment, and then decreed that any man any man who could rid the kingdom of these giants would be given his daughter Drea's hand in marriage and be made heir. Needless to, hear, needless to know, when the princess heard about this, she was not amused. But, being a dutiful daughter, went and sought solace in her sewing room. The next morning, the messengers set out across the land carrying the word of the king's decree. But as they rode on and out, a force on the border, they passed by the ruins of flattened farmhouses and ruined cabbage crops, and saw the wreckage of armor and weapons and bones that told muted stories of their own. And they realized with heavy heart that the cream of the kingdom's knighthood had already fallen or fled. And so it was with heavy heart, they rode on and out of poor Selenor's borders, seeking knights from foreign lands to entice. Now the first to answer the call was Sir Abrick the Green from the East. He strolled into the castle, puffed up with his wealth and importance, plumped himself down on my throne, and stayed thus. With our green simple toils, he quoted, I shall be made king, and all shall be hobbled. <laughs> well, needless to say, the princess didn't care for the man one bit. And besides, he seemed to fancy mirrors far more than any man should. But still, 
she knew that it was her duty as the princess to offer some words of encouragement. But all she could rather really manage was a chilly... Hey, Putin, smile on you, sir! Well, he flicked her a contemptuous look and said, Thus, 